Welcome, everyone. We're going to give uh, maybe wait another minute or two to start. So just please get get comfortable and we'll start in again just a minute or two. Thanks so much. Okay, I see we have a great audience. My, uh, my name is Chuck Walker from UC Davis, and I'd like to welcome everyone. This is our second conversation with Latin American authors organized by the Center for Latin American Studies at Stanford University, the Querida Bolivar House, and Hemispheric Institute in Global Affairs at UC Davis. Uh, we will be joined uh, uh, by Cristina Rivera Garza in January, the writer and historian, vice versa. And we have some others coming up in February and March. So please stay tuned for these subsequent ones. I'm delighted for this conversation today. Lina Brito is Associate Professor of Northwestern University. And as you know and can see, she is the author of Marijuana Boom, The Rise and Fall of Colombia's First Drug Paradise, uh, published by University of California Press 2019. It's a very rich account of the lesser known drug boom and war in Colombia, but also a lovely regional history of the Caribbean coast and an intriguing and important analysis of an enclave economy. It's much more, it's a very smart analysis of all the connotations of what Colombia and the association with the drug war meant, how people live this process and more. We are very fortunate to count on and we're grateful for Ricardo Lopez Pedrero, who's a professor of history in Western Washington University. He is also an esteemed historian of, of Colombia. In, for example, in 2019, Duke University Press published Makers of Democracy, a transnational history of the middle classes in Colombia. So the format is the author, Lina, will speak for 15 minutes or so. Ricardo will have a similar time. We'll make sure to have time at the end for questions. I think chat format is the best, but we might be, we'll also see, I know last time we were able to unmute people and have almost real communication. So again, I wanna thank our presenters today and I wanna thank our colleagues at Stanford University. So take it away, please. All right, so uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Charles, for this invitation, for organizing this event to Adrian and all the people behind the scenes who helped uh, to put this together and make it happen. Um, and to obviously my, my friend and co-editor and colleague Ricardo Lopez Pedreros for being here, for accepting this invitation to comment on my work. So what I'm just gonna do is um, share a PowerPoint that I have with me where I'm gonna be laying out kind of like the generalities of the book. Um, obviously it's impossible to cover all the details, so I'd be very happy to expand on different aspects of, the, of my work during the Q&A. Uh, but for now, kind of like just give you the general contours of, uh, of what the book is about. So are you guys right now seeing the full view, correct? Perfect. Uh, so as uh, Charles uh, Walker said, the title is Marijuana Boom, The Rise and Fall of Colombia's First Drug Paradise, and it was published early this year uh, by University of California Press. So uh, it's a, a paper baby of the pandemic. Um, and um, what was interesting is that before the pandemic happened, one of the, the most interesting and, and, um, and fastest changes that were happening uh, in the world, but particularly here in the United States was the, uh, the rapid change in marijuana policy, right? So here in the United States, we have the map, uh, which was updated this one on November 4, a, a month ago by um, um, a company that gathers information on several issues. So they've been updating uh, information on marijuana legalization and decriminalization. And as you can see, only six states uh, all, still have marijuana completely illegal. Everything else 
have legalized completely marijuana or at least the medical aspect of medical uses of marijuana or have decriminalized the use uh, in possession and production of marijuana. So the publication of my book before COVID was the main thing happening this year. Uh, it coincided with this sweeping change in marijuana policy throughout the world. In the case of Colombia, medical marijuana is legal, albeit it's not yet regulated and that's still a very contentious political battle about how to regulate that market. But recreational uh, marijuana is still prohibited in a contentious matter. Um, here in the United States, as you can see, it's practically um, uh, legal or on the way to be completely legal everywhere. In Chicago, where is the city where I lived, uh, the very first day of the of the uh, of the legalization of marijuana, which was January first uh, this year, 2020, nearly 3.2 million dollars were made in legal weed, what sold in Illinois on the first days of sales, marking one of the strongest showings in the history of marijuana legalization. That's what the Washington, the Chicago Tribune reported the next day after this happened. And as you can see here, the long lines outside of the dispensaries uh, of people to get legal marijuana. So before all this happened, long before marijuana came in from the cold, an agrarian country in South America, my country, Colombia, which was traveling a rugged road to industrialization and urbanization, supplied the US, the largest market in the world with tons of weed at a moment when youth challenged the US government's forms of domination and hegemonic projects at home and abroad, one joint at a time. So this country, Colombia, at least for the last 50 years, had been represented of the world stage by these two mestizo men with thick mustaches. So Juan Valdez, on the one hand, in the 1960s and 1970s, and Pablo Escobar, on the other hand, uh, from the 1980s to even until now. So these two men, Juan Valdez, was a fictional character that he was created in the 60s and during the 70s became very famous to promote Colombian coffee in the world stage. Pablo Escobar, as most of you might know, was a cocaine campaign who in the 80s and 90s waged a war against the Colombian state and the US government against its own extradition to the United States for cocaine charges. So between these two icons, Juan Valdez and Pablo Escobar extends the history of a country that in only two decades transitioned from a coffee republic to a narcotics nation. And before the bucolic Juan Valdez yielded to the warmongery Pablo Escobar, marijuana traffickers, popularly known as marimberos, partnered with U.S. buyers during the late 1960s and throughout the 1970s to flood North American cities and suburbs with the drug, capitalizing on growing countercultural demand. And at the end of the decade, these traffickers resisted the frontal attack of the state. They were known as marimberos because marijuana in this part of the country was known under the euphemistic term of marimba, like the musical instrument, but it's actually a, a term that descends from people of African descent in the Colombian Caribbean coast, mariamba, that's the original term. So these pioneers of the drug trade make Colombia the main drug supplier of the US drug markets, and later on became the first targets of the war on drugs in not only Colombia, but South America as well. However, the boom they brought to life is a forgotten chapter of the innocent era before the cocaine industry car bombed the country. So they came from the northernmost section of the Colombian Caribbean coast, which you guys have here in the map. So this region is comprised by the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which you can see kind of like the shades and shadows on the map. Um, which is an uh, independent mountain range between the cities of Santa Marta, Rihuacha, and Valle du Par, right there on the map, and the Guajira Peninsula, farther to the north. These two regions were considered until that time, and even 
we can say until now, as barely belonging to the nation state. So it's not a coincidence that Macondo, the fictional town of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 years of solitude and paragon of pre-modern isolation was located somewhere in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta after the Buendia family migrated from the Guajira. So here we have um, Garcia Marquez when he received the Nobel Prize in 1982. So how was it possible? How did a peripheral region and its people become the birthplace and pioneers of the illicit drug trade that turned Colombia's coffee republic, a model of democracy and modernization in Latin America into a narcotics nation? And why does this first boom in illicit drugs not only decline, but also fall into oblivion? So these unanswered questions were the points of the departure of my book. So for the past four decades, scholars, journalists, and artists have focused on untangling the ins and outs of the hydra of cocaine processing, trafficking, diplomacy, and war. The popularly known Bonanza Marimbera, that's the term for the marijuana boom, uh, was not very much addressed. The few works that talk about it were produced at the time of the boom when social scientists, politicians, and diplomats tried to explain a novelty for which there were no precedents and they had no frameworks. And between academic debates and ideological controversies, experts and stakeholders forged a consensus according to which this boom was a regional anecdote of the absence of the state in a peripheral region, in a frontier society, and the result of the moral degeneration that US consumers and smugglers brought to Colombia with them in their search for new sources of supply of marijuana. Its decline, on the other hand, has been interpreted as the logical outcome of boom and bust economies and the takeover of the country by the cocaine cartels. In my book, I take a completely different approach. And instead, I conclude that the marijuana boom was as dramatic turning point in the history of Colombia as the one that took place with coffee. Moreover, I find that the marijuana boom was also a critical component of hemispheric relations to the extent that it served as a training ground for the war on drugs in South America. So without denying the weakness of the central governments and state institutions in the marijuana region, and without denying the crucial role that US buyers played in stimulating this illicit export economy, I argue that the causes of the boom cannot be found in what Colombian anthropologist Margarita Serge has called the myth of the absence of the state. It cannot be found either in external factors. Instead, I examine and analyze the process of integration of the broader region that includes the Guajira Peninsula and the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta into national and international political, commercial, and cultural networks centered in the Indian interior and oriented toward the United States. So my argument is quite simple and it has two parts, two components. On the one hand, I assert that the marijuana boom was the product of unintended consequences from a series of state interventions that the Colombian government carried out in the region in pursuit of agrarian development and nation state formation. From the early 20th century into the late 1960s, these modernizing reforms were implemented with support from US federal governments and private investors and multilateral institutions. The contradictory ways in which local, regional, national, and international groups of interest coalesced in response to these state reforms and to make these state reforms possible created new arenas of contestation and accommodation, which materialized in the marijuana boom of the 1970s. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, the other part of my argument, I address the decline. And without disregarding boom and bust dynamics, 
and the rapid expansion of the cocaine business as factors for the decline, I call attention to more important causes. What are those causes? In particular, the political and diplomatic struggles to define the state response to the growing drug traffic between Colombia and the United States. I think those political and diplomatic negotiations and struggles to define the state response better explain why the marijuana economy collapsed. In particular, I argue that the reason for the decline is that the marijuana region became a laboratory for US and Colombian governments to experiment with a novel approach to a statecraft and international cooperation, which consider drug production and traffic as national security threats that warranted bilateral military interventions in those regions where national sovereignty and US hemispheric hegemony were being challenged. The criminalization of producers and traffickers and the militarization of the region between 1978 and 1980 was a concerted initiative on the part of Colombian and US governments. And they were deliberate strategies to sort out deep domestic crises in both countries that were unfolding in a context of increasing militarism due to the escalation of the Cold War at the end of the 1970s. So the campaign of crops eradication and traffic interdiction, which you had the picture just right there, prompted marijuana traffickers to develop mechanisms of survival that gave way to a ferocious competition amongst them. So their business practices morphed from certain degree of reciprocity and solidarity to indiscriminate violence, making marijuana cultivation, commercialization and exportation an expensive and less viable practice. So how I do this, this you kind of like um, twofold argument. So I use a multi-scale perspective on local, regional, national, and international developments. I also use approaches to commodity studies, which are a classic in Latin American historiography. And I use methods of political, cultural, and diplomatic history. I divide the story in three parts. The ascendance, which covers from the early 20th century to around 1972, kind of like to talk about the deeply, how deeply rooted traditions of contraband smuggling and production of tropical export commodities, such as bananas, coffee, and cotton, intersected to create the basis for the new marijuana export sector. Then in the second part, the part of the peak from 72 to 78, more or less, I talk about the bountiful years of the boom itself when this inchoate micro-traffic in marijuana turned into a full-fledged export sector after the emergence of local crops exclusively this time for exportation. And in this part, I pay great attention to cultural and social mechanisms of mediation among traffickers. And I do um, uh, cultural history on how they use musical folklore from the region to project themselves in the regional and in, in regional society and consolidate the process of class formation, which obviously felt, but still during those years was a very important uh, practice that kind of like kept the violence or the competition within the business in check. And finally, in the third or last cycle, which I call the decline, I studied the years from 78 to the mid 1980s to talk about uh, how producers, intermediaries, exporters, exporters, and buyers became targets of criminalization and how the region, both the Sierra Nevada, the Guajira Peninsula, and the villages, ports, um, and surrounding cities became militarized settings. And in this context of <coughs> and militarization, the marijuana export business. <coughs> so I I really like to think 
the regional history in broader terms and comparative terms. So by addressing Colombia's forgotten history of its marijuana boom, my book contributes to decoding one of the greatest conundrums of our times. And what that is, how illicit drug economies and cultures emerged in the Americas in the last quarter of the 20th century, and why massive drug trafficking and violent structures that sustain it were born. Thank you so much. I'm, I'll be happy to get your questions and uh, dig deeper in any of these aspects of my work. Ricardo, please take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for you know the invitation. Thank you everybody for you know coming to this you know presentation. I must say that it is indeed you know, a pleasure uh, for me to be here to discuss you know uh, Lina's book. I, I have to say that I wanted to be you know formal and say you know Professor Brito's you know book, but I have to say that you know um, I'm convinced that you know knowledge production is done through you know friendship, and this is indeed you know the case. So. Um, I go with, you know, Lina's book here. And this is indeed, you know, a moment for, you know, uh, of celebration. Congratulations, Lina. This is, you know, a wonderful book. Um, felicitaciones. So um, I really hope that, you know, the book get, you know, the readership that it deserves. Um, it is indeed a ground deep, groundbreaking book. It's a carefully, you know, a crafted, well-researched and thought-provoking um, study on the histories of the Bonanza Marimbera of the 1970s in Colombia. Combining an ample set of sources and a detailed ethnographic work, Lina offers a multi-layer analysis of marijuana boom that put to, you know, together social, economic, diplomatic, political, and cultural history in a transnational you know, framework. And, um, Lina doesn't actually just you know, tell this, it's like, you know, shows that that's indeed you know, <laughs> Um, Lina wants to tell this story to explain the process through which Colombia moved from a co you know, coffee republic in the early 20th century to a drug paradise in the 1970s and early 1980s. The marijuana boom should be understood, she argues, as the product of unintended consequences stemming from a series of state interventions that the Colombian government carried out in pursuit of agrarian development and nation state formation. This is, you know, in, you know, brief what she, you know, tries to do. I do not have the time to do justice to the multiple arguments presented in this book. If you have not read the book, please do read it. It is a joint, I mean, a joy to read this book. And it is not just another book about drug business. There are plenty of those out there. But Lina's argument questioned those scholars who are obsessed to search for the metaphysical, you know, um, reasons as to why Colombia has become a narcotics nation. Um, most of these studies have perpetuated a foundational narrative in which the drug business is the cause or the real source of Colombian violence and never ending war. The history of the drug business are, in these accounts, historical destiny, very much of, you know, colonial legacy. It's a colonial, you know, a, a Colombian problem. Those, these books, Lina's book reclaims a narrative, reclaim historical contingency, reclaim social agency, far from being destiny or the main cause of you know, violence. You know, the marijuana boom was a product, a consequence, the outcome of multiple struggles over a modernization project. And contrary to most historical interpretation, we still understand this marijuana boom as a result of a natural regional isolation, the outcome of a weak or absent state, a putative pre-modern traditional makeup of you know, the members of a particular isolated re you know, region, this political economy consolidated itself thanks to a development of a capitalist society informed by contradictory modernist modernizing efforts since the early 20th century. Lina presents to us along the rear, something that we don't do you know, anymore, um, historical narrative, the Guajira Peninsula, the Sierra Nevada, the Santa Marta region in an international framework to explain the ascendance, peak, and decline of the marijuana you know, boom. It is, in a war, a history, history of capitalist development. But it is also an interdisciplinary effort, history, anthropology, and journalism 
it used to explain how the marijuana, you know, business political economy, cultivation, production, traffic, consumption, distribution, and all the social and political identities associated with such an economy partially materialized the promises of modernization, you know, projects through which different social groups accumulated capital, experienced a certain degree of upward mobility and achieve cultural and political recognition in a context of rapid politic change, political change and urbanization. It is, Lina argues, um, a political economy uh, of the Bonanza Marimbera that shaped and was produced by the capitalist development during the 20th century. Um, far from being a parallel or even an illegal reality to the history of Colombia, this story is at the core of modernization project of this nation. It was a highly contested response to modernization on its very own terms. As a political economy, uh, uh, Lina concludes, this bonanza constituted a new arena of resistance and accommodation to the agrarian modernization in the very own terms of modernization itself. I quote, fulfilling, the promises, albeit temporarily, that modernization step reforms made, but failed to deliver, the marijuana boom succeeded in boosting the region's agricultural productivity, entrepreneurial innovation, capital accumulation, urbanization, and cultural uh, projection. As this description suggests, these arguments allow to what I've you know, been referring to for a while, the deprovincialization de of the histories of Colombia. The effort here is not just to tell a different story, but also telling a story in a different way. In so doing, Lina history says the Bonanza you know, Marimbera as a way to theorize big questions about liberalism, consumption, gender identities, the organizations of work, the consolidation of a capital political economy, and system of domination. But what is indeed fascinating about this book is that Lina offers answers to these big questions by providing local, regional, national, and transnational histories simultaneously. We find an alternative historical narrative of Colombia, that one that goes beyond that of lack, deficiency, and absence. This book invites the reader to embrace a methodological and theoretical approach through which the multiple stories described here matter not only to a place called Colombia, but also to larger universal question about capitalism during the 20th century. Now, allow me to ask some questions that I hope will initiate a discussion here. I have very simple yes or no questions questions to highlight some aspects of the arguments and questions to contextualize some of the importance of those arguments that I think you know, are important in the book. The first one, a question about how modernization is perceived or historicized in the book. Early in the argumentation, Lina tells us that the marijuana would fulfill the promises, again, although you know, temporarily, that the modernizing state reforms made but fail to deliver. My question here is quite simply, simple. What were the promises by the state-led modernization project that were not delivered and that Lina tends to call failure? I ask this question because it would, this would help us see the role of this modernizing project from a top-down perspective in a different light. Yes, I want to know more about this because it would help immensely to question a historiographical tendency to see Colombian elites as the consolidation of an old powerful oligarchical rule who have historically used an ample repertoire of violence practices to control social and political unrest in society. In this particular argumentation, historiographical argumentation, there is always a tautological assumption that you know, often perpetuates itself. Elites, those at the top of a social, political, and economic hierarchy, dominate others in societies because they are elites. And simultaneously, they are elites because thanks to their elite status, they're able to dominate others. In this book, though, I believe we have another expl explanation, although I would argue it is indirectly discussed. So again, what were the promises by this top-down modernizing project? 
or in other words, what was at stake? The promises of a modernizing project, that is all historical actors of this story agree on the promises of modernization and fought for the real implementation, the material implementation, or there was a contested process about the meanings and practices of how such modernization could actually, you know, what such modernization could bring and for whom. In the second, and my, my, my second question, in the second part of the book, Professor Brito Lina fully develops a history of modernization from the bottom up in an effort to see how different social groups appropriated such modernization experiences through questions of class interests, gender practices, political identities, and notions of community belonging. It is here what you know, the reader can see how Bonanza Barimbera in the 1970s as a daily experience partially provide the real possibility to materialize social, economic, and political, political and cultural recognition. It is in the second part that we see how different historical actors, peasants, agricultural workers, settlers, urban you know, migrants, among others, refuse to give up or materialize a world mobility, urbanization, capital accumulation, and social recognition that the discourse of modernization brought to the fore. The question for me here is this. Where did these historical actors find political, political inspiration to legitimize their claims to have access to material rewards and a social and political recognition, as well as gender distinction, and in particular notions of masculinity? Lina, I suspect, would say that such claims were inspired by modernized, modernization projects. And if this is the case, what we have here then is not just a modernization project monopolized by an all powerful elite, as is often suggested in the historiography, but rather the contextual process over the very practices of what it meant to be modern, in the, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. So here is the yes or no question. If it means reading your argument here, Lina, uh, we have again a different reading of the formation of the elite domination. Would you agree with me? My next question is about the third part of the book. As I was you know, reading this part, I kept asking myself the following you know, question. In the late 1970s, why did elite state officials, US government and international institutions five the marijuana boom so challenging and even threatening to the point that they wanted to destroy a capitalist experiment via violence and criminalization? Perhaps in a more provocative way, one could ask, why did they want to criminalize capitalism? I repeat, criminalize rather than celebrate capitalism? If, as it is carefully shown in this book, the political economy of the marijuana business was at all possible thanks to a modernization project, the formation of capitalist subjectivities, entrepreneurial values, and gender distinction, distinctions, what some would dare call a capitalist society, why the reaction in the late 1970s and early 1980s? Was it because this capitalist economy was based on notions of solidarity and reciprocity, conceptions of economic success predicated on collective effort rather than individual one? In other words, how can we understand that the policy of the late 1970s and early 1980s that sought to control, militarize, and above all criminalize the marijuana business were simultaneously predicting on the very ideas, values, and subjectivities that the political economy of the Moranza Baribena, Marimbera partially represented? Private property, capital accumulation, concentration, entrepreneurial values, et cetera. It is perhaps in this context that we can talk about the consolidation of a neoliberal rule that sought to exhaust and limit what capitalism was supposed to be. And this brings me to the, perhaps the most important question and final question here, or last question, this was you know, discussing. The notion of illegality and the legitimacy of the drugs business. Lina shows, uh, particularly in the second part of the book, the thin and often blurred line between the legal and the legitimate conditions of the marijuana book in order to shed light how producers, intermediaries, exporters understood their activity as socially sanctioned and therefore you know, legitimate you know, practice, despite being aware that such business practices were breaking the law. 
a simple question. Why such political economy remain illegal? It is because the boom show an alternative or counter you know, capitalist organization. Um, following the argument presented in this book, one could actually see how the very notion of illegality was a state-driven effort, perhaps the class and race of the law, to exclude multiple alternative uh, forms of capital accumulation, social, cultural, and political recognition associated with the marijuana boom as an improper capitalist economy and thus subject to the legitimate violence of a proper capitalist state in the hands of the elites. It is the very context definition of illegality, along with the possibility to secure a social and political legitimacy of modernization, I would argue that allowed urban and their elites to conceptualize Colombia as a patchwork of hierarchically organized and racialized region. The white mestizo and the center stood at the top, where the mixed race, Indian and black lowlands stood at the bottom. And although these groups were not excluded from the nation, they were excluded from the minimal political participation in the national community and access to resources. And perhaps the very political economy of the first drug business allowed a challenge to this regionalization of political power and economic resources. Is this why the state invested in creating a notion of illegality, not only to exercise and legitimate violence, as most studies continue to argue, but also to legitimize why the so-called center of the nation and all the racialized and class connotation should concentrate resources and political power in a proper capitalist economy. Maybe that is the main reason why the marijuana boom became forgotten. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. That was fantastic. Lina, would you prefer to give a short answer or do you want to open it up for some questions first? What do you prefer? I know there's a lot here, so I will ask you to be brief so we allow. And I don't have answers to all of Ricardo's fantastic questions. Uh, there's a lot of food for thought. Uh, but I do have a, a couple of things that I just want to say before uh, I get questions from the audience as well. So, um, kind of like trying to compress uh, all your different questions, which are, by the way, not yes and no questions. <laughs> uh, unlike in modernization, how it is perceived and, con and conceptualized, what were those promises uh, that were made or expected and did not fulfill. Um, the other part about modernization from the bottom up uh, and how that kind of like changes our understanding about elite domination in Colombia. So I think like, um, we need to distinguish between di different things here. I think there was, and I show that in, in chapter first, especially, although in chapter two as well, but especially in chapter one, um, how that, that language of modernization became like the language of contention in the region during the first half of the 20th century, precisely because all these different agricultural agrarian economies that were being uh, uh, finance in the region from like bananas in the, in the area near Santa Marta to cotton in the area near Valle du Par. Um, and they were supported by a state in public institutions, by multilater multilateral institutions, by uh, US government agencies, such as the Department of Agriculture, uh, USAID, et cetera. Um, so how like these, these projects of making this part of the Colombian Caribbean coast kind of like an, agri uh, an agriculture, a producer uh, for large commercial agriculture, right? And that required certain reforms to change the ways in which agriculture work in the region. And those were kind of like the guidelines or the promises made uh, that I refer in my book as the unfulfilled promises of modernization. So exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about land redistribution that was absolutely central and crucial in people who have studied um, Colombia in the mid 20th century, especially during the National Front 
period, um, notes very well that land redistribution was not just a project in this region, but in, in the country as large. Um, educational reform, that was another very important uh, project, you know, kind of like expand elementary and secondary school and even offer some channels for higher education as well. That was very important. And again, uh, like consolidate uh, commercial agriculture for both um, agricultural commodities for exportation and for domestic consumption as well. And, and that commercial agriculture as a source of employment for uh, men and women in the region. And those three aspects are the ones that, I, that it never really materialized. But what we see is that those promises that came from the part of the state also had their corollary uh, from the from like the people who were going to be the beneficiaries of those reforms, right? In this case, in this case, like the the uh, uh, the peasant sectors in the region, uh, the ones who own small farms in the region, the seasonal workers, the agricultural working class, as I call them in my book, uh, they also had their own version of what those modernization process should look like. And in their cases, we've seen something very different. They also talk about education. They also talk about land redistribution. They also talk about commercial agriculture. But the key difference between the two projects, the project that came from the part of the state and the local elites, local elites working in association with the state and becoming the main beneficiaries of that state projects and the, and the modernization, modernization and modernizing ideas of the lower class sectors, the, the peasants and the seasonal working classes. Um, the main distinction between the two is that for the popular sectors, the ideal was to create commercial agriculture uh, in the hands of small producers. So instead of large producers being the main beneficiaries and they were the main, um, the, the main goal of a state projects, the popular classes, they have the same vision, but in their vision, they will be the beneficiaries, the small producers. And that's when we see the clash happening in different, sec in different geographies of the region. Uh, many of those clashes were quite violent, and I give account of that in, in my chapter one and chapter two, uh, how, you know, like uh, a lot of social mobilization, a lot of confrontation, a lot of like uh, police harassment, uh, because the police were mobilized by these landlords in order to defend their property rights. So the language of contention that modernization was the language of contention for everybody, but the vision was very different. Who the beneficiaries of that was very different depending on what sector of society we're talking about. And your last part, and with this, I'm gonna conclude because I don't really have a very good answer for th those last questions that you made. Um, why states wanted to criminalize this capitalist enterprise? And it's not because they have any moral, moral concern or that they were worried about these mechanisms of certain solidarity and reciprocity and certain moral economy behind this sector is not because of that. It was more about a more cynic real politic in the sense that there was a going on process since very early on here in the US and later in Colombia of national governments in the case of the US federal governments becoming the main agents in drug policy and drug control. And this happened to coincide with certain domestic crises that made drug policy and drug control kind of like an easy, a cheap uh, solution uh, to tackle several problems at once. But I'm going to leave it here uh, because I really want to hear from, uh, from the audience. And maybe with questions from the audience, I'll be able to go deeper into these, these aspects. Thank you, Lina. Great. Thank you both again. So uh, please. Uh, we're, we're, we have time here for some questions. Please prefer questions and, and make them brief because we don't know, you know, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of issues here. There's a lot to talk about. So um, I don't know if one of people want to unmute themselves and go directly, that would work. Or raise your hand here and I can, I, or send me a chat and I can read it, whatever you prefer. In español, inglés, I've got, we've got a couple questions there. Español está bien. Lina entiende más o menos.
So can can I ask a question? Yes. Hi, um, Chuck. Hello, um, Lina. Thanks for for the presentation, both uh, Lina and Ricardo. Um, I was wondering what's so particular about um, La Guajira and uh, Sierra Nevada Santa Marta, if we can imagine that the sort of modernization policies that you're talking about happened, you know, throughout the country. Um, well, the cotton boom in Cesar was, you know, particularly strong and localized. Mm -hmm. And there was the history of banana production nearby, you know, starting early in the 20th century. But still, if what you're saying is that these kind of, of economy is a product of modernization, then why, why in the Guajira and not why everywhere else? And I guess I'm also trying to understand a little bit more about the the regional local history, you know, I, I understand that this is pitched for a Latin Americanist audience, but I guess that being Colombia, knowing the area, I would like to know a little bit more about the particular regional history of, of the marijuana boom. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, gracias, Claudia. Um, so yeah, why particular? Because there's a, a constellation of factors that only combine in that way in this particular region. So on the one hand, we have all these agricultural economies that I mentioned and, and you just mentioned again, this history of, of banana production for the mostly US market because that commodity was for exportation. Then we had the history of, the, of cotton production, which was mostly for the domestic industry and a little bit for exportation as well. Um, in the Guajira in particular, we have several uh, bonanzas of exportation of agricultural products that were harvested in, in the indigenous territory of the Guajira, especially the DVDV was very important uh, at some point in the 20th century with markets in Europe mostly, uh, but to go to those markets in Europe, they pass by the Caribbean islands, mostly uh, Aruba in Curaçao, the Dutch islands. So there are these um, traditions of um, production of agricultural uh, commodities for exportation. But what is very important about this region um, which is kind of like the factor that articulated the whole thing is the tradition of smuggling and contraband, which we have it very active and alive in two focus in the, in the region, which are, by the way, the, the two focus uh, where the marijuana export sector originated. And that is the area near Riwacha and the area near Santa Marta. And each contraband tradition was very different because in the case of Riwacha and the Guajira, it was more connected with uh, these inter-ethnic relations with the indigenous people, the Wadju people of the Guajira and the connections with the Dutch and the, and the Caribbean islands nearby, right? But they had the know-how, they had the connections um, with buyers um, in, in in the US markets passing by the Caribbean islands that it was very important for this initial micro traffic. I'm gonna use the term, even though right now we use the term micro traffic to talk about something else, but here I'm using, talking about the size of the traffic. It was really minimal. And then in the case of Santa Marta, we have a completely different tradition of contraband that had to do with um, uh, with the with the golden years of the banana economy, um, and that contraband um, involved as well uh, different sectors of the local society, from like popular sectors to elite sectors. So. What happened in this in the late 1960s, in the second half of the 1960s, is that we have the decline of the banana economy at the same time that we have another cycle of, of bonanza of the cotton economy. But by that moment, the cotton economy had stopped um, kind of like uh, being um, uh, expensive and wide economy. It was, it had become very concentrated in a few hands by that moment. So we have a bonanza in the cotton sector that it was concentrated in a few hands, a decline of the banana economy in another area of the region. And that left, you know, like elite sectors and middle classes like very um, uh, unprotected. And, and kind of like finding solutions to this predicament of their economy, right? And we have the traditions of contraband as uh, the easy way out to this. 
that added to a demand on the part of U.S. buyers who were arriving directly to this region in search of marijuana. And not only to this region, they were arriving to many places around the world. Uh, Interpol, and I have that in one of the chapters, uh, reported about U.S. buyers and marijuana consumers going to different parts of Europe, North Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera, looking for new sources of supply of marijuana, right? Because Mexico, which was the traditional source of supply, was not enough. So in the late 1960s, all these different factors combined in this particular region, right? The decline of the banana sector, uh, a boom of the cotton economy that was highly concentrated and very unequal with this growing demand that was going to, coming to the very same region looking for new sources of supply with these traditions of contraband smuggling and some um, local um, marijuana fields that already existed since way before the golden years of the banana economy. So the, night, the, late, the second half of the 1960s is the moment when all these different factors that had not been um, in conversation with one another until that moment kind of like combined to produce the perfect storm. Uh, so that's why this region became the, the, the center of this bonanza and not, for example, uh, Urabá in Antioquia, which was also producing marijuana for exportation to the United States, but it, be, it did not become the center, the epicenter of the marijuana bonanza because it didn't have all these conditions going on. Uh, and to talk about Urabá will be a completely different story because then we have to get into the history of cocaine and that will take us somewhere else. So I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you, you have a, a question from Byron. Do you see that? ¿Qué te yeah. Para realizar dicha investigación? Uh, gracias, Byron. Um, so I guess I'm going to answer in English. So uh, er, the lengua franca. Um, no, oh, okay, listo. Um, Uh, so, lo que me inspiró fue en, en gran medida uh, mi propia historia personal y familiar. Um, parte de mi, toda mi familia paterna, mi padre, son de la región de La Guajira y parte de esa búsqueda de conectarme con ellos, de entender mejor esta otra parte de Colombia donde yo no nací y no crecí, pero que también sentía mía. Um, este tema se convirtió como en ese gancho y en esa, en esa puerta de entrada a, ese, a esa otra parte de, de mí, de mi identidad personal, de mi historia familiar. Um, y aparte de eso, pues siempre estuve interesada en las historias de, de las periferias colombianas. Um, cuando era periodista, eh, había hecho ya un trabajo parecido en el Golfo de Urabá, que acabo de mencionar en respuesta a la pregunta de Claudia. Era un trabajo periodístico, no un trabajo histórico, pero siempre muy interesada en las periferias, entonces ese interés por las periferias, además de esa búsqueda personal y familiar, eh, se combinaron perfecto en este tema que, que en Colombia, en términos de cultura popular, ¿no? pop culture, eh, se habla muchísimo de eso y se ha explotado bastante en, en, en literatura, en televisión, en telenovelas, pero desde la academia no habíamos producido un, un, un trabajo que lo mirara de manera amplia. Uh, lo que existía escrito había, sucedi había sido publicado en el momento en el que había ocurrido y el tema se había dejado a un lado porque el tema de la cocaína se convirtió más urgente y más importante. Entonces vi ahí como una oportunidad de hacer una contribución a la historia del país y a la vez eh, embarcarme en una búsqueda personal y familiar de mis propias raíces. Anyone else? Alguien más? Uh, me right here. I'm just going to jump in, Chuck. Uh, Lina, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned uh, history, anthropology, and journalism as your main approaches to your uh, research here. And um, As you mentioned in the previous answer, you had some familial ties with this research as well. So there could very well be maybe a fourth element working there, but I wanted to know whether you favored one approach over another or throughout the research process, if you had one methodological framework that actually uh, benefited more than another one. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, gracias. Uh, thanks for that question. So um, in terms of, of methodologies and when I'm working, uh, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, what's the word, eclectic. I just, and, and, and instrumental, I just used, you know, kind of like whatever my intuition and my, and my imagination tells me is appropriate in the moment. Um, but I definitely think of myself as a historian first and foremost. And why a historian first and foremost? Because um, historical thinking is not an ex exclusive um, property of historians, right? Uh, but historical thinking allow us kind of like to, to see the big picture and to play with defining what that big picture is. And that's what I really like. I, I, I really like to, to um, feel that I'm being challenged by complex and multidimensional uh, processes. And, and I don't feel that journalism of anthropology, at least for the kind of stories that I wanna tell uh, are enough for that. But I feel that history is kind of like an umbrella that really like many things fit under its wig, its wings. Um, and, and it gives me the chance to tell a story, right? Because the storytelling for me is very important. Narratives is very important so to tell a story. And at the same time, uh, to try to understand the different, the constellation of factors that produce a particular change, how the old yielded to the new. Uh, and that's basically historical thinking, right? We are concerned with explaining change. Um, so at the moment of, of, of doing the research, I resorted to all kinds of things. Like, for example, during my research, I, with some people in, in conversations and interviews, we ended up like, drawing maps, for example, and that's a very anthropological tool, right? Um, that's not very historical. Um, uh, but at the end, at the moment of producing a text, of writing a text and publishing a text, I think as a historian in the sense of what is the constellation of factors that allows me to explain a particular moment of change. A question you're going to like. Someone says, uh, could you please mention some of the music that you used in your research? And then I also, I, Viridiana Hernandez would like to make a question. So could you answer the music question? They yeah, will... um, let me share my PowerPoint again here, just because I would love to play a little uh, segment of a song. So right here. So in the in the section uh, where I address the peak, which are chapters um, three and four, um, chapter four in particular is about those social and cultural mediations that allow these traffickers to uh, kind of like keep competition in check and still like work together or at least not mess with each other. Um, because at this moment, the business was still very wide open and, and a, a, a lot of people with their own particular connection, which is the name that they, they use to talk about the buyer, right? Anybody with a connection with a buyer in the U.S. Um, with, for large or small amounts uh, could perfectly step in in the game and do their things and do their shipments and make some money. And music, Vallenato music in particular, which is the, the musical folklore of this region of Colombia, became kind of like a stage, an arena where these traffickers, these men, because they were all men, uh, who were engaged in, in these processes of, of war mobility, or at least aspired to become successful merchants and men of statue, right? Uh, they used this musical folklore to project their personalities or their public personas, uh, to make a name for themselves, to showcase their profits and their success. And, and they ended up in the process shaping also the sound and the lyrics of this music. So I'm just gonna play um, this little example that I have here, which is by the uh, Hermano Zuleta, who are a very important Vallenato uh, band, uh, still active uh, until very recently. And 
let me do this. Uh, and then I'll show you the, the translation of the excerpt that I'm gonna play right now. Oh, wait, let me see if I'm sharing my sound as well. Otherwise it's not gonna work. There you go. Sorry about that. So these are the lyrics. Um, what the hell, I don't care what people say that I'm a degenerate drunk. I just want them to have in mind that I work and I don't beg. What if I'm a party animal? Who cares? I am Luki. Luki was the nickname of one of the most important marijuana exporters at the time. Uh, listen to me, who cares? If I party, it's because life is very short. So what I'm saying in my book is that basically the paranda, which is the name of, for the specific kind of party um, in with vallenato music is play live and, and many times it's composed live, improvised live. Uh, the paranda became that stage, that social and cultural arena where these men in this process of uh, upward mobility and capital accumulation um, uh, projected their personalities and uh, showcased their profits and, and kind of like uh, constructed themselves in the public arena as men of success, as womanizers, our insatiable eaters, our like uh, loyal friends. Uh, but it was all kind of like an effort of uh, social and cultural projection uh, looking in pursuit of recognition for who they were, right? Um, and what I said is that these social and cultural mechanisms really help during those bountiful years of the peak of the boom in the mid 1970s to keep competition in check because in the paranda, they recognize each other. They affirm the hierarchies that connected with one another, the hierarchies that connected one link of the chain with another. Um, and, and, and they celebrated what they consider a tremendous achievement, which was to like make money and, and become a merchant, which was kind of like the main um, idea at the time uh, in the region. So that's kind of like um, chapter four in, in trying to understand how the, the bonanza, the boom years um, took place and how it changed, was shaped by the cultural, uh, the regional culture, and at the same time changed and transformed regional culture. I know some people are leaving and it is one o'clock, so feel, well, there's no guilt here, but I know Viridiana has a, has a question. Go ahead, Vidi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for this wonderful presentation. I have enjoyed it much. I can't wait to read the book. I'm really intrigued. And I find fascinating the way that you were able to, to construct a whole narrative that is incorporating international factors, local, national, regional. I think it's just amazing. But my question is related to, to the local relations of power, particularly, since I don't know this region, and it seems that a very important part of the argument is, regards with how different people conceived modernization and modernizing mm -hmm. projects and the collision between these different uh, views of what being modern means in a rural context. I was wondering if you, how did you handle differences of if they were any differences between those views about what uh, modernization means and how to be a modern grower for, let's say, indigenous people or mestizo peasants or uh, medium-sized growers or farmers in this region in particular. Because I understand the projects at, at, at the national and international scale tend to be similar, but the, the talking about specific 
differences in these local realities were you were you able to find those uh, those different portrayals and how did you mm -hmm. did you face them mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for that question. That's a great question. And because it really um, helps me to talk about some of the blind spots in my book, right? Because we always need to make sacrifices uh, with our books, because we cannot write about everything. Um, and one of the blind spots that I have in my book is precisely the, these alternative visions from like indigenous people, for example, and why they don't they don't really figure here, because what I understood um, is that they they did not they participated in the bonanza but in like very uh, menial work they were not the ones making kind of like business decisions they were not the ones driving the whole business forward right um, they were just kind of like under the table getting the crumbs from other people's decisions and, 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 and not because they don't have historical agency is that just because they were doing something else. For them, the main, the story at this time for the indigenous people of the Guajira, the Wayu people, is the history of Venezuela and the development of the oil economy in Venezuela. Is the history of their migration to Maracaibo, is their history of, you know, the process of urbanization toward Venezuela because their uh, territory is a binational one. Well, their territory is their territory, just when we created these republics ended up being a binational one, right? So that the, the story of the Wayu modernization that still needs to be written is that story, that story of proletarianization and migration to Maracaibo and to the oil district of Venezuela. But in the case of the Bonanza Marimbera, by that time, uh, this other process of migration to Venezuela had already happened. It had been underway from at least two or three decades, if not more, um, since the oil district uh, took off in the 1920s, right? When they began exploitation uh, of, the, of the oil reserves. So, so I didn't pay much attention to that because the main historical actors in the marijuana bonanza is the mixed race population. And those are the visions of modernization and modernity that I pay attention to because they were the ones that I wanted to understand. What are they, what are they thinking? What are they trying to do? What they are, you know, um, embarking themselves in this enterprise, right? And that's the one that I, that I characterize as our answer to Ricardo's question as exactly one in the same kind of thing, appropriated the language of modernization in terms of commercial agriculture, urbanization, land redistribution, um, uh, generation of employment, but from the point of view, not of large producers, but small producers and how did that did not materialize uh, through legal commodities and legal sectors, but through an illegal commodity, which was marijuana, an illegal commodity that was socially accepted and therefore legitimate, precisely because of those traditions of contraband smuggling uh, participated in illegal uh, in, 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 in networks of circulation of either illegal commodities or, or, or networks that were um, um, not paying taxes and therefore considered illegal on the part of the state uh, was a legitimate activity and, and it was okay to do. So we have another split right there between legal and legitimate. And in that split, this generation of marijuana traffickers um, emerge and, and, and manage to, to uh, survive for a decade or so. Well, it's always a great sign of a talk and an event when people stay over because sometimes they end early or people look at their clock. It's the opposite here. So, I mean, I know a lot of people are, have to leave. I We will be off in a few minutes, but if someone gets, wants to sneak in a final quick question, we can do so. And if not... I see two questions ah, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. from Carlos Garcia Saban that's uh, saying that I mentioned Alonso Sanchez Bautes, uh, Libranos del Bien. Uh, and he also mentions La Mala Hierba, which I also talk about it in, uh, in my book and I read it and, 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 and I found it fantastic. But I didn't, um, what there are other literary connections in, in, my, in my research? Yes, of course, uh, um, 
and even telenovelas, you know, like uh, um, there's Laura Restrepo's book, uh, Leopardo al Sol, which is also about one of these uh, family wars or vendettas, as is known uh, in the region, that took place in the context of the marijuana bonanza. But my book doesn't really, and then again, that's another blind spot, doesn't really connect with, that, uh, with these uh, uh, literary works. Um, just because a lot of the um, research, a lot of the scholarship on, on drugs in Colombia and in Latin America more generally are about representations. And it's not that I don't think representations are very important. They're absolutely crucial, but I wanna, I was intrigued with what is beyond the representation. What can we know about how this business actually worked? who was doing what and for what reason and where. Uh, so I was really intrigued with understanding the political economy of the business, understanding the political uh, and social history behind the whole thing and the cultural history. And I wasn't paying that much attention to questions about representations, uh, either in literature or in pop culture, uh, just because I feel that that has been done more often. And I really wanted to contribute in an area that hasn't really been explored. So trying to um, kind of like open new fields of research or, or, or questions, no, abrir trocha, as we said in Spanish, uh, I sacrifice other aspects that are very important, but I feel that other people have done it uh, and probably they could do it better than I can do. Um, and finally, Maria Teresa Molina, she says, Tengo una pregunta. ¿Cree que la población sudamericana está preparada para una legalización de la marihuana, considerando que no solo tienes fines medicinales? Sí, definitivamente. Um, y en Colombia tenemos grupos absolutamente fantásticos de activistas que están haciendo un trabajo fabuloso, no solo de activismo en las calles, Y en, y en los medios sociales, sino también en las redes sociales, perdón, sino también haciendo investigación ellos mismos, eh, aprendiendo, educándose y educando a otros sobre la historia de la marihuana en Colombia, no solo de la bonanza marimbera, sino de la marihuana para, la, para el consumo doméstico, que es otra historia completamente distinta, que no es la de mi libro. Uh, y ellos están haciendo un trabajo maravilloso, gente, um, muchos de ellos que están utilizando um, su entrenamiento como sociólogos, como antropólogos, uh, como abogados, eh, para um, darle uh, profundidad y darle uh, sustancia a su activismo político. Uh, yo sí creo que uh, en términos sociales estamos preparados, en términos políticos definitivamente no, pero simplemente porque, bueno, soy muy pesimista respecto al, al, a la política en Colombia y, y esa es otra conversación. Uh, pero creo que en términos uh, uh, um, de, la, de, de las, los sectores sociales uh, que están llevando la conversación adelante, uh, ellos están muy lejos en el debate y están muy lejos en la reflexión y están haciendo trabajo fabuloso. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone. This has been fantastic. I, some people have left, many have stayed. Um, certainly, you know, um, they can contact you. They can also contact Ricardo. That's a wonderful read. I hope you write this up in, in a review. I just want to thank everyone. In these grim days of Zoom, I'm a pessimist. I, generally, I'm not excited about Zoom events, but this one really worked and really brought us together. I see friends from across the country. Uh, across the globe, actually, and others. So please, I know, Lena, if there are further questions, you're available on email, mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, I want to just thank everyone, and I want to thank Global Affairs and Adrian Batasca, who did the hard behind the scenes technical part of this. So thanks to everyone. Muchas gracias. Hasta pronto. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Gracias. Chao, chao. Y felicitaciones, Lena. Gracias. Gracias. ¿Cuándo sale en castellano? Pregunto. No sé, tengo que ponerme en la tarea de, de buscar traducción y buscar editorial. Sí, se puede, ya, yeah, perfecto. <risa> chao, chao, gracias. Chao, abrazo. Gracias. Hasta luego, muchas gracias. A Ricardo, chao. a ti. Ah, para el siguiente, ahí está. <risa>